Hey guys, this is Dr. Harrington, and today we're going to be talking about stroke. Now, this is a quick rundown about stroke. Stroke is an incredibly complicated topic, both within itself and regarding the literature surrounding it. There's lots of controversy. So we're really going to try to just focus on what I think you need to know right now. Now, why is it important you learn about stroke? Well, for one, it's the leading cause of disability in the United States, and it's the fifth leading cause of death, or at least it contributes to death. Uh, in these people. 3 to 4 percent of strokes occur in 15 to 45 year olds, so it's not uniformly an old person's disease. And about a quarter of these are secondary to cervical artery dissection, so it's rare on the whole, but in this group it's a little bit more common, and so I think it's worth learning about. Furthermore, um, CM Fisher said neurology is learned stroke by stroke. By studying stroke, so what happens when a small or sometimes a rather large area of the brain stops working, we can learn which each of those areas does and what they contribute to the whole. So what is a stroke? Well most simply a stroke is any disease process that interrupts blood flow to the brain. Remember blood flow uh, carries nutrients like glucose and oxygen to the uh, cells in the brain. And so anything that interrupts this is a stroke. Now if it causes an, if it causes an infarction that's the cell death of the brain can be spinal cord, retinal cells even, that's attributable to ischemia. That is, you can't get enough oxygen and glucose to the cells. If this is transient, it's called a transient ischemic attack. If the deficits are longer lasting, so nowadays it seems like that's about an hour, it's called a stroke. And there are lots of ways this can happen. You can have thrombus formation or clot that forms within the cell, the embolus, where an embolus comes from somewhere else and lodges, you can have a bleed. You can have dissection, you can have compression from a tumor, or you can have hypoxia. And each of these uh, mechanisms explains the different syndromes we see in stroke. So thromboembolism, this makes up 85% of all strokes. It's the most common cause of stroke and TIA. And the treatment is, as I like to refer to it, liquid money, but TPA or alteplase. Despite what the literature says, there really is some controversy surrounding this. Now, if stroke-like symptoms last, as I just discussed, less than an hour is the current definition, then you call it a transient ischemic attack. And this is important because... 10% of these folks go on to complete a stroke in the next six months, and half of those happen within the first week. So from an ER perspective, this is what we're going to say to our consultant, and this is why we admit, because lots of these TIAs turn out to be strokes waiting to happen. Now, you can also have other kinds of stroke, like hemorrhagic stroke. This accounts for about 15% of all strokes and in can include intraaxial or parenchymal, so inside the substance of the brain, or extraaxial along the surface of the brain, and this would be extra, uh, um, epidural hemorrhage, subdural hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Okay. These tend to be secondary to long-standing hypertension, sometimes a genetic predisposition like that of uh, berry aneurysms, or sometimes due to trauma. And these usually present with headache, which is far more common in these rather than ischemic strokes, vomiting, usually secondary to increased intracranial pressure, altered mental status and or focal deficits, and usually this is where we'll see cranial nerve deficits. <clears throat> All right, dissection. So dissections can be aortic, but more commonly when we're talking about stroke, we're talking about carotid or vertebral. <clears throat> and these tend to present uh, with lateral neck, face, uh, and head pain. This tends to be a uh, disease of the young. <clears throat> so like we mentioned earlier, this can be up to 25% of strokes in people between 15 and 40. Classically, it's thought of happening after trauma, which may be minor, like whipping your head around because uh, something startled you, or chiropractic manipulation. Now, this can cause strokes by one of two ways. Number one, as you tear the, the wall of the vessel, you begin to form clot in this area, trying to clot off the defect. Now, this clot can embolize on downstream, so if it's a carotid on into the anterior cerebral artery or the middle cerebral artery or this uh, this dissection in this clot can grow and it can ultimately occlude the artery as an aside this is the most 
common cause of Wallenberg syndrome or PICA syndrome, right? Lateral medullary syndrome. Um, when you get a dissection of the vertebral artery that extends on up into the PICA. And these actually tend to have pretty good outcomes. Now there are some other reasons that you can get stroke-like symptoms or strokes really. And these are uncommon. I think they're unlikely to show up at this point in your training, but I think they're worth you hearing about. Um, and this includes cerebral sinus thrombosis. This is what it sounds like, thrombosis of the cerebral sinus. Um, this tends to be associated with hypercoagulable states, so the peripartum or postpartum periods, in association with malignancy, active infection, or in association with genetic or acquired prothrombotic stakes. Okay, this usually involves a headache and may include altered mental status. It can have focal signs and symptoms like hemiparesis, which can be a bilateral, or things like aphasia, and then seizures. So the classic question, at least in the ER, is a postpartum girl comes in with a severe headache and a new onset seizure. We're worried about things like eclampsia, which we talked about in the uh, seizure lecture briefly, but they can also be cerebral sinus thrombosis. And this can be identified on a venogram and sometimes on a CT scan like you see up here with what's called a delta sign because it looks like the sign, the Greek symbol delta. You can also get problems like vasculitis, so like uh, lupus. And inflammation of the vessel wall can actually cause edema with subsequent obstruction. You can have occlusive crises like sickle cell, where the sickle cells actually occlude the vessel lumens, or thrombocytosis, or polycythemia, where the sheer number of cells or the number of platelets makes you, uh, puts you into a prothrombotic state. And then sepsis, and this is a really important one in IV drug users in particular, um, is septic emboli. So if you have somebody that has infective endocarditis or immunocompromised, they can shower their brain with septic emboli. Now, usually these people are very sick. They're in a lot of pain, and these emboli can go anywhere, including their lungs. Look like multifocal pneumonia. They can go to their mesentery and cause severe abdominal pain. Now, the most common presenting symptoms of stroke are aphasias, visual changes, ataxia, or weakness, sometimes sensory changes, and then headache, which is more common in hemorrhagic strokes. But strokes can present with lots of symptoms. From the nebulous and unhelpful confusion that we may see in like a frontal stroke, to the more unique incontinence of frontal lobe strokes and seizures. Now, as an aside, Note that women can present with different symptoms than men, and they're more likely to present with more complaints that are less specific. So, for instance, I feel weak and dizzy and nauseous, and I'm a little short of breath, and I just feel funny. The problem here is this makes them more likely to be blown off as just being dramatic. That said, women are still far more likely to present with the classic signs and symptoms of stroke, and they should have the same physical exam. So, if they present with something like syncope, or unexplained falls or an accident, or associated pain from an unexplained fall, sometimes respiratory complaints or a seizure. And I fairly recently had an example of this with an elderly lady who presented for a fall. She had a history of vertigo that was unchanged from her baseline, and her only complaint was right hip pain. And we x-rayed it, and it was normal, and CT scanned it, and it was normal, and she would not get up and would not walk on it. And she had been ambulatory, so we admitted her. She deteriorated later that afternoon. They got a CT scan, and she had a pontine hemorrhage. And her only presenting complaint with a normal neurological examination was right hip pain. This is a good example of how sometimes women, particularly elderly women, can present a little bit differently. Now, when discussing symptoms, we need to think about how long the symptoms have lasted. The goal is to get these people in under three hours because the guidelines suggest if we're going to treat them with a clot buster, it needs to be done preferably within three hours. Now, there's some debate about this, and I'm not going to get into it for you guys at this point, but it is important to realize that a lot of the literature you're going to read uh, is uh, highly rhetorical and suggests that we should be giving this to everybody and probably putting it in the water, when in fact there's some pretty good evidence that it's probably harmful and may not help at all. But the guidelines are what they are, and right now they suggest that symptoms under three hours, uh, you should be offering these people therapy and maybe between three hours and four and a half hours. So you want to know how long these patients have had their symptoms. Now, what happens, as often happens, if they just woke up from sleep and had these neurological symptoms? 
Well, you have to count the time that was last known well, and in this case, it would be the night before. So moving on, the physical exam that you have to do in a stroke patient. Now, the whole physical exam in somebody you're worried about for a stroke is incredibly thorough and involves a lot, but you guys at least need to be able to do some basic things, and part of that means being able to recognize what different strokes look like. But in general, my saying has been, Hear them talk, watch them walk, and look in their eyes. So you're looking for problems with their extraocular movements, right? Cranial nerve palsies. You're looking in their eyes for pupillary reactivity to light. You're listening to their speech, to the cadence. Do they have difficulty finding words? Do they have problems with their fluency? Okay. Do they have emotional tone to their voice? They're going to watch them walk. You're looking for ataxia. Do they swing both arms? Do they tend to lean to one side? If you can't get them out of bed, you can check their proprioception with the test depicted here behind these two fellows where you move their toe up or down and ask them which way it moves. And then DTRs. Check their upper and lower extremity DTRs. Now, the most f frequently missed signs of cortical dysfunction uh, are in these four categories. And this includes higher cortical function, so language is more often missed if it's subtle deficits in language or subtle problems with syntax or grammar. Okay, memory, which is often not tested, and awareness or neglect, which can be very subtle. Because a lot of people who end up with neglect compensate for it. And so sometimes if you're not really trying to... Um, root out and neglect, you'll miss it. Level of awareness, so Glasgow Coma Scale, or uh, alertness, verbal responsiveness, response to pain, or unresponsiveness, kind of the easier way to look at this. The visual system, so visual acuity, which a lot of times is not tested. Extraocular movements, which usually are. Visual neglect, once again, can be very difficult to appreciate unless you're looking for it, and nystagmus. And then gait. In the emergency department, this is probably the most frequently overlooked uh, test, is to simply get the patient up and move them, looking for ataxia. Okay, when you sit them up, the, up in the bed, you're looking for truncal ataxia. You make them walk, looking for limb ataxia. Do a heel-to-toe walk or tandem gait. Check a Romberg. If you do these things, this actually covers a lot of ground. By watching them walk, you cover the sensory motor areas down through the cerebellum, the anterior medulla, and down the spinal cord. You had a pupillary and extraocular exam with a note on nystagmus, question the patient about diplopia, and you covered the pons up to multiple association areas in the temporal, the occipital, and frontal lobes. Add to that a visual field test, visual acuity, and you cover the occipital lobe. Think about all the optic radiations that go from the occipital lobe through the temporal and parietal lobes, and then go through the optic chiasm to the eyes. So you really cover a lot of ground here. If you had a Romberg test, you check for dorsal column function. And then lastly, you assess, uh, oh, here, watching them walk, you check for general movement. And lastly, assess language to assess the parietal, some frontal lobe, and, um, and some temporal lobe function. If you note the quality of their speech, so the cadence and emotion associated with their speech, you also get the non-dominant lobe. So a few examples of strokes from my experience. So the first is a uh, lady, she was in her uh, mid to late 40s, and she presented with her fiance, and he was actually the one with the complaint because she couldn't recognize him. He stated that she woke up that morning and was acting oddly, um, and didn't seem to recognize him. So they presented to another ER. They were discharged from there and came to our ER. Now, I did a neurological examination and couldn't find anything wrong. But my attending came in, uh, started talking to the lady, and asked her to write something. And he handed her a pen. Now, we're standing on her left side, and she just stared at us until he slowly moved the pen over to the right side of her body, at which point she immediately grabbed the pen and then began to write what he was asking her to write. Now, the other interesting thing that happened with her is that she was able to write f perfectly, but when he asked her to read back what she just wrote, she was unable to do so. So she was demonstrating a couple of things that were fairly classic of an occipital lobe stroke. And you can see here, these are drawings from people who have had similar problems. And you could see that there was no right side or a poorly drawn right side of the face. Okay, now this demonstrates some neglect. Now in these strokes, 
You can see in the picture at the bottom left, there's a big gray area in the back of the head on the left side. And that corresponds to the PCA here. And what these strokes tend to do is cause uh, a hemianopsia. So half of the visual field is gone and it spares the macula. What this really means clinically is you need to check four visual fields. Top right, top left, bottom right, bottom left. Okay, and this was one of the things I didn't do on this patient that would have showed us uh, what she had because that's what she was seeing. Now, a lot of these people look toward the lesion and they'll kind of compensate. A lot of these people will actually confabulate images, so they'll imagine images um, because they have anisognosia. They don't realize they have this problem. And neurologically, this is what is happening. You've bagged the area of your brain that processes information on the right side of your visual field. Okay. Another case, and this is not one I saw, but it was made famous by Oliver Sacks, and he actually wrote a book that was titled after this guy. It's called A Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. And this was more of a progressive problem, but this happens in strokes. In his story, university conductor began to struggle recognizing his students. And when he initially saw Dr. Sachs, um, he had what seemed to be a normal neurological examination, but on standing to leave, the man reached to his wife's head, who was sitting next to him, and attempted to remove it as if he were trying to take a hat off a coat rack. At the next visit, on entering the room, Dr. Sachs greeted this man. The man immediately walked over to a grandfather clock with his arm outstretched as if to shake its hand. So he had a condition called prosopognosia, okay, which is the inability to distinguish faces, even of people that you know well. And this man, being a conductor, had excellent auditory uh, capacity, and so he was able to distinguish people by their voice, but could not distinguish them by their face, even mistaking them for inanimate objects. And the problem is he didn't really fully appreciate that he had this problem, which is a condition known as anisognosia, or to not know you don't know. Okay. And the reason that this uh, reflex down here is on here is because it was, a, and this was initially coined by Babinski. Now, these, uh, this syndrome uh, is usually attributable to the temporal lobe, and it can also cause problems with neglect. But more often, it ha is associated with problems like prosopognosia, because a lot of times people can see things like faces, but they cannot incorporate these into a meaningful experience. So they can't take all the features of a face, two eyes, a nose, and a mouth, and, and mentally make sense of that to say this is a face. And more importantly, this is so-and-so's face. Now, this syndrome is also associated with Alzheimer's disease, which tends to affect the temporal lobe. And this is because of the visual association areas we see in the temporal lobe. So when you think about a temporal lobe stroke, like uh, you would see in a patient with this kind of symptom, on the dominant side, you're going to have language problem because the temporal lobe includes Wernicke's area. Okay, this also processes complex auditory information, although this tends to be bilateral. So usually you don't have problems hearing. Because the hippocampus and amygdala are housed underneath here, you have problems with learning, memory, and emotions. And because you have uh, visual association areas, you have problems with visual object recognition or uh, visual agnosia. Now, when we think about the vascular supply here, and you guys should have gone over this before, think about the anatomy and where the amygdala and hippocampus lie. All right, if you think about this in terms of uh, the vascular anatomy, this area has a lot of overlap between the MCA and the PCA vascular distributions, which accounts for a lot of the overlap you see between an occipital lobe stroke and a temporal lobe stroke. It's not so important that you can differentiate between these two. It's much more important that you realize that these are stroke-like symptoms and you remember to do the physical exam to look for them. Now, we'll get into more depth about those in a minute. We're going to take a quick break and talk about stroke mimics. Now, stroke mimics are really common in stroke literature. They're frequently fought over, and usually because concern about stroke mimics is one of the reasons we don't give TPA, and neurologists and people who are paid by drug companies really want us to give TPA. Okay, once again, there's a whole debate here, but let's go over some of the things that can look like a stroke, and there are lots of them. So these are myriad. They can include everything from Todd's paralysis, which we talked about in the seizure unit, 
all the way around the list from peripheral nerve palsy to multiple sclerosis, toxic metabolic causes, encephalitis, um, hepatic encephalopathy, cardiac failure because of the hypoxia, right? And you can get those watershed infarcts, vertigo syndrome, complex migraines, and malignancies, um, particularly if they cause compressions. And there are many, many more. These are the big ones with seizures being the most common, all right? So when you think about stroke mimics and how you need to go about ruling these out, clinically, what do you need to do in a stroke patient? First of all, you need to think about hypoglycemia, okay, because it is the easiest cause of focal neurological deficits to evaluate and treat. We can get a bedside finger stick glucose. And hypoglycemia can cause confusion, altered mental status, altered behavior, seizures, coma, hemiplegia, hemiparesis, this sounds a lot like a stroke, aphasia, and especially, unfortunately, associated with a right-sided paresis. So it can look a lot like a left-sided MCA stroke. How do we figure this out? Well, with a bedside finger stick glucose, and if it's low, you give them D, uh, an amp of D50. Now, note, hyperglycemia can actually do this too, but usually it's in association with something like diabetic ketoacidosis or hyperosmolar hyperglycemic, non-ketotic states. This basically creates a metabolic encephalopathy, but these folks can have a homonymous hemianopsia, hemiplegia, half your body can be uh, uh, paralyzed, hemisensory deficits, and aphasia. So once again, it can look a lot like an MCA or parietal stroke. All right. Let's reconfigure this and move on. So we've got other things like complex migraines, and 25% of these can have focal neurological deficits. Remember, this can be caused by cortical spreading depression, so it can actually create an MRI image that looks a lot like a stroke, and some of these, if they're particularly severe and long-lasting, can cause permanent deficits. There is something called a hemiplegic migraine, and uh, this is what it sounds like. It's a migraine with an associated hemiplegia. You can't move half of your body. The worst part about this is you can have the headache without the symptoms, but you can also have the symptoms without the headaches. So this is a really difficult diagnosis to make in somebody with a history of migraines who now has isolated hemiplegia, particularly because people with migraines have a slightly higher risk of developing stroke. And over time, this can cause permanent changes. These people tend to have gradual worsening of visual problems, sensory deficits, aphasias, and even cerebellar symptoms. Okay, demyelinating disorders like multiple sclerosis can cause stroke-like symptoms. They can cause hemiparesis, cranial nerve palsies, visual changes. If you think about multiple sclerosis, the most common initial presenting complaint is optic neuritis. So it's about a fifth of them, but it's still the most common presenting complaint. So this is a visual field loss associated with an afferent pupillary deflect and a loss of uh, red color vision. You can also see this in things like leukoencephalopathy from viruses, ingestions, medications. Um, and then the JC virus in immunocompromised patients, usually you hear this in HIV patients. Um, and this can be associated with a progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, probably more than you need. These are things you get from the history. The other thing we're going to put in this category is vertigo because you can do a quick HINTS exam. And we talked about that in the vertigo lecture. So you get a good history and you do a good HINTS exam, and that's going to knock these things out. Now, rearranging a little bit, <laughs> you've got mass that you're going to rule out by doing a CT scan. These guys are going to get an emergent CT scan looking for masses and for bleeds. Okay. Then you've got encephalopathies. These can be hepatic encephalopathy. It can be hyper or hyponatremia. It seems like usually hyponatremia causes seizures, um, but you can get uh, cellular swelling and a metabolic encephalopathy with hypernatremia. And this can cause neurological changes, sometimes focal neurological changes. All of these things can be uh, evaluated with lab testing. So this is why we're going to get some labs. This is also partly based on history. And that will eliminate these from our differentials. So we've eliminated all those. We're now down to seizures and functional hemiparesis. Now remember, seizures are the most common stroke mimic. And this is particularly because of Todd's paralysis. All right. Now remember, focal seizures can cause a hemiparesis. They can cause gaze deviation. That's called aversive deviation, right? It's usually associated with head turning and decreased mental status. Todd's paresis or Todd's paralysis tends to be a post-seizure deficit, so a post-dictal deficit, and this can last from hours up to 48 hours. It's going to last a long time, so it can actually meet criteria, stroke criteria past the transient ischemic deficit. And once we've ruled that out, <coughs> our diagnosis of exclusion is functional hemiparesis. 
this is a somatoform disorder. Okay, there's no anatomical cause for this, but these patients, as far as their conscious mind is concerned, actually have these deficits. You could take somebody with functional hemiparesis uh, or hemianesthesia and stab them in the leg with an 18 gauge needle and they will not flinch. Okay, it's pretty impressive. Somebody with functional hemiparesis cannot be malingering. All right, there cannot be secondary gain. Um, otherwise, it's called malingering. And usually they do flinch when you stab them with an 18 gauge needle. All right. Now, once we get past this and we think this really is a stroke, okay, you use the NIH stroke scale to grade your patient. This is going to help us decide how severe the stroke is. And the elements of the NIH uh, stroke scale are uh, level of consciousness, uh, visual capacity, sensory motor function, how well do they feel and move, right? Their speech, you're looking for any evidence of aphasia, and then you're going to evaluate them for neglect. And what's important for you to know at this point, because Everybody looks this up when we do it. You have a sheet and you follow the instructions. What's important is you know what's bad and what's good. If the score is less than four, it's considered a mild stroke. If it's greater than 22, it's a severe stroke. And this is all important because this determines who gets TPA. And anybody between four and 22 is considered to have a moderate stroke and they, are, uh, they meet criteria for TPA, at least regarding the NIH stroke scale. Now, Let's go over a few stroke syndromes because these, this is the way you're going to learn the neurology of this. This is going to tell you what you what kind of physical exam you need to do. Now, the classic and the most common stroke that we see is the middle cerebral artery stroke. Now, the basics of this, it's going to be contralateral face and upper extremity weakness and numbness. So if somebody has face and arm weakness and numbness, and you can have a little bit of leg numbness as well, uh, but primarily upper extremity greater than lower extremity. All right, you need to think about an MCA stroke. These people tend to have a lateral gaze preference toward the lesion. So if they had right-sided deficits, they'd be looking left, right? Because it's contralateral. Uh, motor and sensory deficits, you're looking toward the lesion, so toward the left. This is called conjugate eye or gaze deviation. These people can have hemianopsia. Half their visual field can be gone because of those optic radiations that go through the uh, parietal and temporal lobes which is what's supplied by the MCA. If the temporal lobe is involved, you can get some behavioral changes. You can have agnosias, so visual agnosias, auditory agnosias to not know. And the reason is because particularly the temporal lobe has all these association areas uh, for vision and for auditory systems. The parietal lobe, once again, that's uh, fed by the MCA, has a lot of sensory association areas. And these people also tend to have anisognosia, especially if it's a non-dominant hemisphere, so they don't know that they have the problem. So think about the anatomy here. In yellow here, you have the MCA. Here's a couple of pictures. And you can see that the MCA covers a lot of territory. It goes from the frontal lobe all the way around the side to the occipital lobe. So it covers a lot of territory. Also remember, because this throws some people off, everything in blue up there, so that's covered by the ACA, that has to filter through white matter tracks down into the uh, basal ganglia. And so a proximal MCA lesion can actually affect the lower extremities. It's just usually the upper extremities are more affected than the lower extremities. The other thing to note about this is since it affects the parietal lobe, and the parietal lobe is the most highly lateralized cortex in the brain, you get very different associated findings depending on if it's a dominant, usually left hemisphere lesion or a right. On the left, you tend to get aphasias, so like Broca's aphasia, which is an expressive aphasia, right? You're unable to think of the correct word. Okay, you have problems speaking fluently, although you may be able to name things, but you have a difficult time thinking of the names of objects. And then you've got Wernicke's aphasia, also uh, on the dominant hemisphere. And this one's associated with the... Um, parietal and temporal lobes and this is called a fluency aphasia the patients actually sound fluent they can rattle off words but it tends to be nonsense now on the non-dominant hemisphere of the MCA okay so usually the right you can have anisognosia so you don't realize you have the problem you can have left-sided neglect and you tend to draw and copy poorly you can also have a whole host of uh, symptoms relative to the parietal and temporal association cortices. So like prosopagnosia because of the temporal lobe association area.
problem with visual or auditory agnosias. You don't know what you're looking at. Things aren't in their right position in space. Um, you can't place uh, a sound coming out of somebody's mouth. You can't connect those two things. There's lots and lots of strange things that can happen on this non-dominant hemisphere. Now, I have some examples. Dominant hemisphere aphasias. Here's an example of Broca's and Wernicke's aphasia. These are fun to read. Try to listen to them out loud. And on the non-dominant side, you've got agnosias, so to not know. And you can have, uh, for instance, left-sided neglect. These three drawings at the top were drawn by people who had uh, occipital and temporal lobe uh, infarcts. And as you can see, they couldn't draw anything on the left side of the pictures. They had some form of neglect. They also tend to draw and copy poorly. So if you have these stroke patients draw, for instance, an intersecting circle and uh, square, they're unable to do so. Furthermore, because of the parietal association areas, people uh, are often unable to connect to these things. So this was somebody's drawing of a person. And you can see they have all the spots. Uh, they have, excuse me, they have all of the pieces. They just can't put them together. So this is almost like a uh, visual artistic version of a Broca's area, right? Because in Broca's area, you can more or less do the same thing. You can say the name of these different parts, although it may take you a while to figure them out. But you can't piece them together in a fluent sentence. And here are some examples of left-sided neglect at the top left of the inability um, to understand or reproduce drawings such as maps in particular. These people tend to get lost easily, even in familiar surroundings. So this is like the older person who takes a walk in the neighborhood and has a stroke and gets lost. Okay. Uh, when asked to copy a picture of this car, you can see they can't put together the pictures. And then there's at the top right, there's a clock drawing in which they completely uh, ignore the left half of the picture. They know they're supposed to be 1 through 12, so they have all the numbers there. Um, but it's like they cannot, they, they, uh, this person will think they did a fine job. They'll think they went all the way around that circle, not realizing there's an entire left half of the circle there. A couple other interesting things these folks will do, especially with a non-dominant hemisphere lesion. You can see that this person just had entire left-sided neglect. They're supposed to circle and cross these different uh, triangles, and they did none of them on the left half of the page. This guy was a bit more interesting and more subtle. He was supposed to circle full circles and cross out uh, circles with gaps in them. And you can see that he's actually circled several circles that have a gap on the left side, and that's because... He has a left-sided neglect. He's just unaware that anything is different there. So his mind kind of fills in the hole. So he has some confabulation. And so he would circle only the incomplete circles with a hole on the left. He would cross out all the ones with the hole on the right, top, or bottom. All right, moving on. Anterior circulation strokes, or uh, excuse me, anterior uh, cerebral artery strokes. These primarily target the frontal lobe. Um... And then you also get some of the uh, medial parietal lobes. So this explains the altered mentation and confusion you see with these. These people end up with impaired judgment and insight because of the effect of the... Uh, ah. Sorry, so because of the effect on the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible uh, as kind of as a, the executive function of the brain. These people can have primitive reflexes, like a primitive suck or grasp reflex. They can have bowel or bladder incontinence, which is kind of unique to strokes and uh, partial seizures of this area. They can have unilateral lower limb weakness and hypesthesia, much greater than upper, if there is any upper at all. Um, and this tends to be contralateral, right? Say so tends to be. It's always contralateral to the lesion. And you can get apraxias. Now, you can get apraxias with a parietal lobe or an MCA lesion, but this is different. So a, an MCA or a parietal lobe apraxia, which means the inability to perform purposeful actions, tends to be because there are lots of a sensory association areas there. So for instance, if I said to someone with an MCA infarct, rub your nose, they probably can't process that information. They cannot associate all the sensory input from their hand into a meaningful message to say, move that hand that I can feel in this position in space, because they're having problems with spatial orientation, to my nose, which I also have to know where it's located in space. They lack that ability. As opposed to, with an ACA lesion, a frontal lobe lesion, 
they tend to have motor hemineglect. They tend to have motor apraxias. Okay, so they cannot motivate their hand to move. And this leads to something like a, uh, a puppet kind of syndrome. The patient can't really move themselves. They have motor hemi neglect, usually on one side. But if they're told to move that extremity, they'll move the extremity. Because they have no problem locating it in space. They just don't have the motivation to move that. Now, moving on, there's uh, lacunar infarcts. Okay, these are parenchymal inf uh, bleeds, usually. These tend to be associated with hypertension in older patients. They result in an either pure sensory or pure motor uh, lesion. Because of where these are located, you typically don't have the associated findings uh, of apraxias or aphasias. Okay, you shouldn't have any cranial nerve deficits unless there's compression. And this is the one I've tend to see the most. Now, these can also be subacute. Okay, this can be a patient that's had the symptom for weeks. This can also be an incidentaloma. Sometimes we find these on CT scans when we're looking for something else. But this is one of the reasons why in any older patient with any strange neurological complaints, with new onset headache, with nause unexplained nausea or vomiting, you need to consider doing a CT scan of their head because these can be subtle in older people. Uh, and I had one of my very first patients as a resident was a 64-year-old lady who came in and pointed to a small strip on her left brow and she said, it feels funny right there and that was her only complaint. And we scanned her and she had one of these. Uh, so these can be kind of odd carotid dissection, like I mentioned at the beginning, this is important because this is the stroke of young people. And these can be really difficult to diagnose because if you think about it, if a 25-year-old comes in complaining of, you know, neck pain after a car accident, most people say, well, you probably got a whiplash injury. And that's how these tend to hide until people start developing pretty obvious signs and symptoms. So these tend to be unilateral neck pain, face pain, and headaches. They happen in younger patients. They tend to be associated with trauma, although sometimes the trauma is pretty minimal sounding. This can result in a hemiparesis or hemianesthesia, what you would expect of an ACA or MCA stroke because the carotid feeds into those, right? If this affects the ACA, you can get a decreased level of consciousness. You can get aphasia if it's a dominant MCA uh, stroke, if this embolizes. You can get a monocular field deficit because remember the uh, op the ophthalmic artery is the first branch off the internal carotid artery. Okay, so if this dissects into there or causes a clot to run into there, then you can lose vision in one eye. And you can also get Horner syndrome, as well as lots and lots and lots of other things. But these tend to correspond to the ACA and the MCA. Now, on the other hand, older patients tend to get thrombosis in the carotid artery. And this can embolize, much like a dissection can. But their symptoms tend to be unprovoked. This tends to be in older patients with vascular risk factors. They may have other vascular disease. But much like the dissection, this tends to affect the ACA and the MCA, and this may have a stuttering or gradual course. This is why we listen for carotid bruits. They're not a great test, but they're good to put on a chart. PCA strokes, posterior uh, cerebral artery strokes. This tends to result in headaches and visual field deficits. This is why we check for visual uh, visual fields. If this damage is the left, these patients have a difficulty reading, and we talked about that with our uh, case earlier. The classic finding here is alexia without a graphia. They can, uh, they can write, but they can't read. If on the right or non-dominant, these people tend to have visual neglect, typically on the left, and disorientation to place because this sends projection to the temporal lobe association, visual association areas. These people can also get prosopognosia. So there can be some overlap here. Once again, it's not important so much to know where that stroke is as to know what symptoms are consistent with a stroke. All right, moving down back on the posterior circulation, we come to the basilar artery. So remember, this feeds the AICA and the PICA and then the penetrating branches. Um, if you include the PCA, so the posterior cerebral artery, then the posterior circulation is responsible for 20% of strokes. So it's probably important that we know these, at least know some basics about these. Now these can be variable. Once again, including the posterior cerebral artery, you can have cranial nerve deficits. This is usually more brainstem, cerebellar because of the cerebellar peduncles where they feed in. <laughs> if this is a hemorrhagic stroke, for sure you can see uh, cerebellar problems. 
this can affect the neurosensory tracts. These people certainly can have loss of consciousness from one of two reasons. One, if it affects the reticular activating system, but the other is if you get edema, um, the edema can actually cause compression of nearby areas. It can also cause herniation, which again can compress particularly the reticular activating system. Because of the PCA uh, involvement in posterior circulation, you can get visual changes, agnosias, alexia, can't read, third nerve palsy, homonymous hemianopsia, and visual neglect, much more common if you have a non-dominant hemisphere stroke. You can also get some altered thought processing. Now, true basilar artery, so penetrating branches of the basilar, basilar artery occlusion causes locked-in syndrome. This means you can move your eyes up and down, but there is no other movement you have control of in your body. The problem with this is you completely maintain your awareness. You are with it. Uh, there was actually a very interesting character in the Count of Monte Cristo who had exactly this. We have talked about pontine strokes. All right, and the pons, you get the AICA syndrome. Uh, which we'll get to here in just a minute, but we did talk about this in the uh, vertigo chapter. You can see in the red here, this is the uh, paramedian branches of the basilar artery. This is what causes locked-in syndrome. And then the yellow is what you see with the uh, AICA syndrome. In general, I, I'm still going to focus on, I want you to remember the basics, the five Ds of a vertebrobasilar uh, <clears throat> stroke. So diplopia, seeing double. Dysarthria, so you can't make your mouth work right to talk correctly. Dysmetria, which is kind of a taxi, you can't do rhythmic movements. Dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, and dizziness. So remember those five Ds. Also remember there are crossed findings. Usually you've got uh, sensory findings, for instance, on one half of the face, and then the contralateral side of the body. So for instance, pain and temperature and PICA syndrome on the ipsilateral face and, bila uh, and contralateral uh, body. You can also have motor findings. All these tend to be things like ataxia uh, that tend to be on the uh, ipsilateral body. So anything with any crossed findings, something on one side of the body and something else on the other, um, you need to think about brainstem. All right. These people can also have ataxia without vertigo, and that would be because of the cerebellar inputs here. These people also should have cranial nerve deficits. So just a quick review of the two things that we did talk about in vertigo. You've got Wallenberg syndrome or the PICA syndrome, lateral medullary syndrome. You can see the picture over here. You get the lateral medulla. This is low. So these tend to come off the vertebral artery. You can see this uh, gentleman here. He's got the right side of his face has diminished pain and temperature sensation. The left side of his body has it, and his right arm and right leg have some uh, ataxia. This, i uh, review some of the things that are associated with it. So bilateral nystagmus, sometimes uh, vertical nystagmus, vertigo, ataxia, dysphagia, hoarseness. This is because of um, your vagus and glossopharyngeal nerve involvement from the medulla. You can read all these things. Um, the only other thing I think worth mentioning is you can get Horner syndrome with this. Um, but this is basically crossed findings with cranial nerve problems. If you add to that tinnitus and hearing loss, you now have AICA syndrome. So we're moving up into the pons. This is where uh, cranial nerve 8 lies. So you're going to have cranial nerve 7, 8. You may get part of 5. All right, so we've gone over most of our uh, stroke syndromes. Um, hopefully you learned some about cerebellar syndromes in um, the ataxia unit, so I'm not going to belabor that point for uh, sake of time here. If you develop stroke-like syndromes and the symptom density continues to increase, you need to worry about a hemorrhagic stroke. So if they've been getting worse and worse and worse and worse and it's not leveling off, this is why we do the CT scan. Now you're going to do a CT scan in everybody. We'll talk about why in a minute. A question, I think a good question is, can you tell the difference clinically? Because usually if we can tell the difference clinically, we're going to try to do that. It's faster, it's more efficient, it uh, preserves resources. Well, there are things that can help like seizures and vomiting, severe headache, loss of consciousness, anticoagulation. These make it much more likely it's a bleed versus things like a history of TIAs, diabetes, claudication, obvious evidence of vascular disease. The problem is, even though you may be able to a little bit get the CT scan, sometimes this is really obvious, okay? But sometimes it's not. Sometimes findings are very, very subtle. Both of these at the bottom um, 
intracranial hemorrhage. So one's intraventricular hemorrhage on the left and the other's uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage right in front of the midbrain. Which brings us to intracerebral intracranial hemorrhage. So what makes you think about this? Well, sudden onset, worst headache of life, loss of consciousness, vomiting, elevated blood pressure. These are all things that need to make you think about uh, hemorrhage. Now, if it's bad enough to cause a stroke-like syndrome, you would expect to see it on a CT scan. And the most common cause of intracranial hemorrhage is a patamenal hemorrhage. Okay, and about a third of intracranial hemorrhages uh, are this. This causes uh, hemiparesis, and this can be partial or complete. It can cause dysarthria because of its effects on the uh, cortical bulbar tract. Uh, it can cause coma and decerebrate posturing, and this is because, as you can see over here, the pressure of the uh, from this kind of mass lesion of blood can actually cause herniation, which is actually where you get these symptoms from. And these can uh, have rapid progression within hours and sometimes, if they're bad, within minutes. So this is just a visual example of why you get what you do. You can see the bleed right there. It gets the cortical bulbar tracts and the cortical spinal tracts. And this is where you get your hemiparesis. All right, over here, it's the same thing. You can see how these tracts come from that homunculus down into the internal capsule, and if you bleed there, you're going to bag them all without all the findings that you would get from a uh, superficial cortical lesion. Now, the treatment here is control their blood pressure because, remember, this is like a hose. It's squirting out blood, and you want to decrease the pressure behind that. So when you think about your antihypertensives, you've got the A, B, C, Ds of antihypertensives, ACE inhibitors, A, B, B for beta blocker, C for calcium channel blocker, and D for diuretics. Now, diuretics aren't going to be very helpful here because it takes a while to work. So let's stick with our A, B, Cs. So A for ACE inhibitor, B for beta blocker, C for calcium channel blocker. Once again, I don't expect you to know these drugs in particular. This is stuff you'll learn on clinicals and, and in residency. But you do need to know that these are medications that you can use to expeditiously treat the blood pressure. Some people are encouraged to try things like nitroglycerin, which we give in chest pain, right? And it can drop the blood pressure. The problem is it can raise intracranial pressure. So this is one time you really don't want to give a nitrate. You use your ABCs for blood pressure. You also want to elevate the head of the bed, protect the airway, because once again, these people can decompensate quickly. If their brain herniates, they're going to stop breathing. Um, make them NPO so they don't vomit and aspirate and admit to a neuro ICU. Once again, this is stuff I just want you to hear. So if it's not that we've done the CT, we don't see any blood, what about an ischemic stroke? Well, for sure you want to give aspirin. Aspirin for sure helps with this. This is really controversial. Uh, I'm not going to go into it for you guys right now. But realize that Alteplase or TPA is currently the guideline recommended treatment. And regarding blood pressure in these, you really leave them alone unless you're going to give TPA. And then you want to get the systolic pressure down to about 185 according to guidelines. Higher than that and you risk uh, hemorrhage. And you're going to use the same medications as um, you saw in the hemorrhagic stroke. Now there have been plenty of studies that have suggested that blood pressure uh, control probably doesn't do much in strokes overall and you're probably raising your blood pressure trying to maintain perfusion to some of these areas. After that, it's all about good post-stroke care, and that's one consistency among all the studies is that patients treated in a stroke center, TIAs treated in a stroke center, tend to do better, and that's probably because they have a nurse whose job it is to treat strokes. They believe in what they do. They do a good job. They make sure the patient has swallow studies and don't get bed sores. Um, they get speech therapists on board. They do all the right things to get these people back to a, some semblance of a functional life. Now, once again, there are some big controversies here that I didn't talk about in this lecture. Um, I think they're hugely important. We just don't have time right now. Uh, for now, I think you guys need to focus on what is a stroke. Okay, so what symptoms, what do the pa patients present? What symptoms um, do they present with? How to do a good physical exam. And, and you need to be thinking about what these things cause and how would you find them, right? By making patients draw pictures, by checking their visual fields, by checking their strength and their sensation, right? Um, you need to know very basically what to do if it's a hemorrhagic stroke. So you're going to get a CT scan looking for hemorrhage or mass. If it's a hemorrhage, you're going to lower their blood pressure. Okay. If it's ischemic, aspirin and TPA. All right. And then admit to a stroke unit. 
All right, know the difference between dominant and non-dominant hemispheres, particularly when it's important stuff like MCAs, where the dominant hemisphere tends to affect language, and the non-dominant hemisphere tends to attack, uh, affect uh, like artistic function more or less, and neglect. Know what a vertebrobasal or artery stroke looks like, primarily with the crossed symptoms, the ataxia, the cranial nerve deficits. These people tend to be very sick, right? I think it's important to know that young people tend to uh, are more likely to present with dissections. So always remember that in differential diagnosis of young people with neck pain and headaches, particularly if they've had recent chiropractic manipulation or trauma. And remember that seizures are the most commonly uh, common misdiagnosis of a stroke. All right. So anytime you think of a stroke, make sure you're thinking about the alternative things that it could also be things such as seizure as complex migraine, peripheral vertigo disorders, right? Uh, so that's it. Thanks for listening. Sorry, that was a lot of information. I promise it could have been worse. Um, and good luck on your test.